in an automobile accident in 1975, my spirit left my body in the emergency room. I experienced the warmth and the presence of God and the peace while I saw my body racked in pain on the emergency room table. Yes, I believe in the afterlife. I know it exists. I've experienced it. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? As Christians, we believe the answers to those questions are found in the Bible, and we accept those answers on faith alone. But what about those who are not willing to begin their journey by faith? Those that are looking for what they consider more substantial evidence. With that in mind, it's not surprising then the level to which modern science has raised the search for heaven. Could it be they're responding to the insatiable need to know more about what life's about and what lies beyond it? Current studies reveal that the vast majority of people the world over profess a belief in life after death and in a place called heaven. Many of us believe in heaven and have at least an idea of what it's like. But for all of us, there are some unanswered questions. This search for heaven will bring us face to face with research experts, Bible scholars and scientists who've been searching for the evidence that will provide critical answers perhaps answers to some of your questions or questions others have asked you. Certainly, we believe that our destiny is heaven, but what are the biblical signposts that will guide us on the path of discovery? Are there spiritual proofs that can be tested objectively? If we find the borders of heaven, do we also discover the gates of hell? Your host for this special presentation is Jerry Rose, the president of a national cable and television broadcast group and the host of a daily television show. He's an ordained minister and has served for three terms as the president of the National Religious Broadcasters. And now, here's Jerry Rose. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. These first words of the Bible establish God as the eternal creator of all things, including heaven and earth. And from that beginning, right through to the book of Revelation, there are many references to heaven. Deuteronomy tells us heaven, even the highest heaven, belongs to God. And it was from heaven that God's voice was heard at the baptism of Jesus. Elijah went up in a whirlwind to heaven. And Isaiah implores us, lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Paul tells us he was caught up to heaven, and the book of Revelation promises there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and the dwelling of God will be with men. These and dozens of other scriptural references give us assurances that heaven is a real place. The book of Hebrews, chapter 8 and 9, teach that heaven is more real than earth itself. And it is important that we understand the realness of heaven and set our eyes on a real place where we are really going to spend eternity. Heaven is a spiritual realm and its existence requires faith. We're told in the Bible that without faith we cannot please God because we must come to Him by faith. Could it be that finally after 6,000 years evidence is emerging that could prove that heaven exists? Mighty cathedrals with lofty spires and humble village chapels have all been built with the hope of heaven as part of the architect's plan. But from the most humble bricklayer to the most powerful king, this magnificent outpouring has its foundation in faith. Could it be that we're at the very beginning of a whole new era of knowledge and understanding? Is evidence now emerging compelling enough to convince the skeptics, even scientists, with recent advances in medical technique, more and more people are coming back from the edge of death. These medical miracles have given rise to a new phenomenon known as the near-death experience. People who apparently slip from the doctor's grasp but come back to life, so to speak, and bring with them remarkably vivid and unexplainable visions. Visions that appear to be associated with all of the beliefs we normally associate with heaven. Dr. Kenneth Ring, Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of Connecticut, has worked with a number of these people. In many near-death experiences, people talk about a feeling of tremendous peace and well-being, 
they often say that they find themselves out of their physical body and are able to see it as though a spectator to it from an elevated position. Many people describe traveling through a dark space, sometimes talked about like a tunnel, and then they find themselves in the presence of a beautiful radiating light of uh, astonishing beauty and where a feeling of love and, and uh, great tenderness comes in. Some of these people also talk about having a life review in which they see virtually everything that's happened in their life. And then they may make a decision to go back to their body or they may be told that they have to go back that their work here isn't finished. Those are some of the typical features of a near-death experience. But there are other aspects of the near-death experience that appear to go beyond the memory of the event and actually center on the immediate things going on around them. In many of these instances, the evidence is very compelling. Let's begin with a recent event that took place at the Hartford Hospital. In spite of heroic efforts, eventually even the best physicians are forced to just give up. But in this particular instance, the patient apparently didn't. According to all medical and physical science, what happened in this particular emergency room was, well, impossible. told the doctor she had left her body entirely while those in the room had been working to revive her. She felt herself being pulled up through several floors of the hospital until she found herself on the roof. She was enjoying the view of the skyline when she noticed something red out of the corner of her eye. It was, she said, a shoe. Obviously everyone was extremely skeptical. After all, hadn't she been completely comatose? But when Dr. Raymond Moody, author of Life After Life, heard about it, he was more inclined to accept the woman's story. Dr. Moody has researched hundreds of these kinds of events. The near-death experience is a powerful statement of the reality of the afterlife. As resuscitation techniques improve, more and more people are having profoundly meaningful experiences when they return from the verge of death. They tell us that they find themselves out of their bodies and yet still functioning and alive. As a medical doctor, I began my clinical investigations of these experiences somewhat dubious, and then quickly realized that we can only ignore the evidence for so long. Inevitably, one of those present insisted on proving the woman's story. It seemed simple enough just to have someone go to the roof and check. Eventually, the reality of what's happening begins to set in, and you become aware that the only way of accounting for the decisive commonalities of these experiences is to assume their validity. That's the shoe. That's the red shoe. Under any circumstance, it seems highly unlikely that a woman brought in on the ground floor in a coma could have had any knowledge of a red shoe on a roof. But it takes more than anecdotal evidence, even this convincing, to achieve scientific credibility. What was needed was some scientific way to demonstrate that the body and the spirit can exist separately. That discovery would provide strong evidence for life after death. But how could that be done? Sometimes answers come from unlikely sources. In this case, the unlikely source was a woman named Pam Reynolds. A stunning array of scientific instruments and measurements were in place at the very moment of Pam Reynolds' death. The results were astonishing. At age 35, Pam was diagnosed with a life-threatening brain aneurysm. Her only hope was a very unusual operation. In order to fix the problem and to save her life, doctors would have to drain the blood out of Pam Reynolds' head. What's more, 
Her body temperature would be lowered to 60 degrees. Her heartbeat and breathing would stop completely, and her brain waves would be flattened. Doctors who perform this intense procedure have nicknamed it standstill, because for all intents and purposes, Pam Reynolds would be dead. But what happened was so thoroughly unique and unexpected, Dr. Michael Sabum, a cardiologist and the author of Light and Death, made an extensive evaluation of the Pam Reynolds experience. The process of death, scientifically, now is known to be a process and not a point in time. It starts with normal waking reality and ends up in irreversible death. During this process, the body dies at different rates. The, the problem we have as scientists and physicians is to determine when the brain is actually dead, i.e. when the person is actually dead. In the case of Pam Reynolds, one of the surgeon's main concerns was seizure activity, which could prove deadly during such a delicate procedure. To guard against this and other complications, Pam's brain and body were extensively instrumented and monitored, which makes what happened next even more intriguing. Pam told the doctor she left her body and became a spectator to what they were doing to her body. Later, she was able to describe people, procedures, and even medical instruments she could not possibly have seen. Pam Reynolds had a very deep near-death experience at the time that she had documented no brainwave activity, no brainstem activity, and actually the blood had been physically drained from her head at the time. So this eliminates the possibility that this was a seizure phenomenon because during her experience, she had no seizure activity on the EEG. In addition, she had plugs in both of her ears, and so she could not have physically heard what was being discussed in the operating room during the surgical procedure. Uh, and she could recall uh, the accurate uh, discussions that were going on between the surgeons at the time that she was having her experience. Remember, every bodily reflex was being monitored. She was in a profoundly inactive state. But Pam Reynolds somehow was able to describe a particular surgical tool in amazing detail. A tool which she would later say looked like an electric toothbrush with a dent in it. She even noticed that the tool had interchangeable blades and that these were kept in something that she said looked like a socket wrench case. How could Pam Reynolds have described with such amazing accuracy the details of what took place in the operating room when she was, according to all monitoring devices, dead? Dr. J.P. Moreland, professor of philosophy at Bible University, finds this kind of experience compelling. The most provocative evidence for heaven from near-death experiences seems to me to be cases where people come back from near-death experiences and they have information there's no way they could have had if they had just had a physical experience while on an operating table. For example, some people come back and they're able to recount conversations that their relatives have had five blocks away from the hospital. In other occasions, people have actually had experiences of objects on the hospital roof or somewhere else where when people go to investigate whether those experiences were real, they see the objects just as the people saw them. In other occasions, people have met dead relatives that died about the same time the person died in the near-death experience. And they came back and reported the death of a relative that no one there in the operating room knew about. Now, this provides pretty strong evidence that something more is going on than just a lack of oxygen to the brain. The Pam Reynolds experience would seem to add one more bit of evidence that the spirit lives on when the body dies. But lives on where? Where does that spirit go? Are we any closer to identifying the place those spirits might reside? Perhaps we're getting closer to heaven. What is it that keeps hundreds of millions of people the world over fascinated by something they've never seen? Are there those who have seen heaven and actually left a record of their experience? Is this notion of a near-death experience, or NDE as it's widely referred to, a purely modern phenomenon, or does it have some historical, even biblical roots? The concept of God in heaven who is active in the affairs of humankind 
has been an important part of biblical teaching for thousands of years and powerfully portrayed in painting, literature, and song for centuries. Interestingly, although different faiths vary slightly in their concept of heaven, all of them focus on the ideas of peace, serenity, and some sort of justice or retribution. These concepts seem to bridge all societal norms. According to a recent Gallup poll, over 70% of those polled believed in the existence of a heaven of some kind. Strong evidence indeed for the power of ideas. Or could it be the idea of a powerful God? Christianity, for example, has for centuries proclaimed that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and yet emerged from the tomb alive. This, according to the Christian view, is a matter of historical fact. The Christian viewpoint of heaven is, is ultimately communicated through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who is God in human flesh, who demonstrated that he was God through the immutable fact of the resurrection. So his opinion is infinitely better than my opinion or anybody else's opinion because Christ is the creator of the cosmos. Christ said he was the way, the truth, and the life, that only through a relationship with him could we be united with him for all eternity. So only those who put their trust in Jesus Christ ultimately are going to spend an eternity with him. But the immediate question at hand is, what is the afterlife all about? And where will we be spending it? Many people create their own ideas of the afterlife because they do not wish to accept the biblical account of heaven because to do so necessitates a belief in hell, and it's easier to create something that is wonderful than something that is possibly uh, degrading or eternally separated from God in heaven. We are eternal beings created in the image of God, who is triune in being. Therefore, we are triune in being as body, soul, and spirit. Upon death, the body goes back to the dust of the earth, and the spirit and soul go back to God who gave it. When God breathed into man, man became a living soul, a part of the eternity of God. Therefore, the soul of man is eternal. Many perceive that we will live eternally in the heaven where God dwells now, when in fact, we will live eternally in the heavenly city New Jerusalem on a newly purified earth. In that city, we will have perfect peace and contentment. The Bible describes heaven as a place of incomprehensible beauty and peace, but the biblical description offers far more. We asked Dr. Tim Sheets what he thought heaven would be like. Heaven is a place where relationships are restored, relationship with God and relationship with friends or family that have already gone on. Heaven is also a place where destiny is fulfilled. Our time on earth is short, but our time in heaven is forever. So destiny is started here. Destiny is fulfilled when we get to heaven. Heaven will be much like earth if you can think of earth as it would have been when Adam saw it. No pollutants. In heaven, we are told that there are rivers, there are lakes, there are streams, there are trees. There are animals, there are fruit trees, there are clouds. Heaven is real. There's doorposts. We're going to have banquets there. Heaven is a very real place. It is not the figment of the imagination. Traditional Judaism also firmly believes that death is not the end of human existence. But because Judaism is primarily focused on the here and now rather than the afterlife, it leaves a great deal of room for personal opinion. It is possible for an Orthodox Jew to believe that the souls of the righteous go to a place similar to the Christian heaven, or that they simply wait until the coming of the Messiah when they will be resurrected. And of course, there are those whose belief system excludes any possibility of life beyond the grave. The skeptic finds no comfort in either the nature of the evidence nor the amount of it. All of the commonly reported manifestations of these so-called near-death experiences can be explained in either psychological terms or in terms of drug-induced or oxygen deprivation-induced um, hallucinations, if you will. 
Uh, I can understand how someone inclined to believe in an afterlife and in heaven might interpret their experiences that way, whereas someone not oriented to that belief might be perfectly happy with a normal, more normal explanation. But can these remarkable near-death experiences be explained away simply as psychologically conditioned responses or hallucinations? There are those who disagree. One of the medical explanations for near-death experiences is called hypoxia. And this has to do with the idea that when you die, your brain is deprived of oxygen. And that explains some of the feelings that you have, such as going through a dark tunnel and then seeing a bright light. However, one thing that that doesn't explain is the fact that people who go through a near-death experience can typically recount with great detail what the nurse and what the doctor said, as well as the very specific procedures that they went through in trying to save your life. So however you look at it, hypoxia and other medical explanations can't account for that one fact. In my research, I have found there to be no evidence that near-death phenomena are caused by either drug-induced hallucinations or psychological manifestations. Having a doctorate in both philosophy and medicine, I think I'm a lot more attuned to some of the profound questions that these near-death experiences raise for human consciousness. And in short, I think it's oversimplistic to say that these near-death experiences can be accounted for simply as drugs or as anoxia of the brain or by psychological factors. Once again, the skeptics find themselves at odds with the experts. But if hypoxia and drug-induced hallucinations are the problem, then there's a lot of it going on. A Gallup poll reports that 8 million Americans, approximately 5% of the adult population, have had a near-death experience. And that's just in today's world. Apparently, this out-of-body event has been going on for a long, long time. Plato wrote of it in his dialogues. We believe, do we not, that death is the separation of the soul from the body, and that the state of being dead is the state in which the body is separated from the soul, and the soul exists alone by itself. Plato frames the question as a foregone conclusion. And the Bible, written and compiled over hundreds of years, contains many stories that suggest some people have had access to the world beyond. For example, in Acts 7, 55 through 56, Stephen has a pre-death vision. Surrounded by his enemies, Stephen cries out, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul describes what many think was his own near-death experience. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. Could, in this instance, Paul have been telling us that he was actually there in paradise? And what other evidence is there for such a place? The greatest evidence of heaven to me is the Word of God. Jesus promised a heaven to us when he said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The Bible teaches that heaven is a real place for real people who will spend a real eternity there with the Lord, enjoying all of the pleasures and benefits that have been promised by God himself. Some believe we'll be like Casper the ghost in heaven, sitting on a cloud playing a harp, but that's not it. A Bible scholar, H.A. Ironside, said, life in heaven will not be that unlike life here on earth, close quote. And by that he meant, we will live on an earth that will have dirt and grass and trees and other people. We'll interact with them. But most importantly, we will have eternal life. We'll live forever. One of the great things about heaven is that death will be a thing of the past. In fact, we'll have brand new resurrection bodies that will never grow old again. No more gray hairs, no more hairs falling out, no new wrinkles showing up on your face in the morning, uh, no cholesterol buildup, no heart problems, 
No fear of death whatsoever. That's one of the great things about heaven. But not only that, we're going to have a reunion with our Christian loved ones. You know, all of us have lost someone close to us, whether it's a child or a mom or a dad. We'll be together with them again, and never will death separate us again. Scripture also indicates that in heaven, all of our needs will be met. God has promised to satisfy all of our hunger and all of our thirst. And so that's one thing that separates the heavenly sphere from the earthly sphere. Never again will we go hungry. Because these examples are taken from the Bible, they're accepted by believers as proof. But to skeptics, they're merely another example of anecdotal evidence. Outside of religion, there is no scientific evidence whatsoever of an afterlife or a place where any of us go other than in the ground, six feet under, pushing up daisies. That's the cold, hard evidence. It's unfortunate, but uh, if we want to think of ourselves as living beyond, we have to do so through our work or through our children, but not through actual immortality. In spite of the skeptics, researchers continuing to build a growing body of impressive evidence are far from being discouraged. While the search for heaven undoubtedly brings us face to face with the unknown and often the unexplainable, there are modern events that continue to provide us with strong evidence of the existence of heaven. The fact is, new clues in the search for heaven are being uncovered even in the halls of science. The most provocative evidence that comes from near-death experience is the fact that when you're having these experiences, you are doing things you can't do in your normal, everyday, waking, bodily life. For example, you can fly, or you can uh, travel instantly from one place to another place. To me, this is indicative of the heavenly realm. The major problem with the medical professions, and in fact, science in general today, is that they refute completely anything that is outside of the materialist realm. Therefore, if a person were to have an unusual experience, such as an out-of-body experience, or a near-death near -death experience, or for that matter, even appear at the pearly gates themselves, no doctor would be able to deal with this experience because by definition, such experiences cannot take place. Is there any way to reconcile the scientific and anecdotal evidence? In order for a concept to be judged scientific, certain scientific rules must be applied. For example, for a theory to be regarded scientifically credible, it must rest on a firm foundation of knowledge derived from facts and principles determined through scientific disciplines and protocols. The question then is, does the anecdotal evidence of NDEs established by medical experts lend itself to scientific scrutiny? Dr. Moody's large body of work suggests that indeed it does. I began my research by talking with about 150 people who had been to the brink of death and had experiences. I was able to identify 15 common elements that occur in these experiences, regardless of the sex, age, or medical condition of the patient. First of all, when a person reaches the point of greatest physical distress, they often hear themselves pronounced dead by the attending physician. They hear an uncomfortable noise and feel themselves moving very rapidly through some sort of aperture, like a tunnel. They find themselves outside of their bodies, watching the resuscitation attempts like a spectator. Soon other things begin to happen. Others come to meet them. They say that they glimpse the spirits of relatives and friends who have already passed away and they find themselves welcomed by a love that's beyond anything they have ever known. At some point, a being of light and love appears and asks them questions and enables them to review a panorama consisting of every event of their lives. And then at a critical point, they are told that they must go back to Earth. Interestingly, in all cases, the person wants to stay, but for various reasons is required or chooses to come back and all of them upon their return report a complete loss of any further fear of death dr melvin morse a neuroscientist and researcher has learned that other changes also occur we learn that having a near-death experience transforms someone for life 
and very healthy, nurturing, life-fulfilling ways. Specifically, they give more money to charity, they're more involved in their communities, they spend more time with their families, they volunteer more hours in terms of volunteering at the hospital or local charities. They're uniquely involved with living life. We learn that there's not only a psychological transformation, but there are physical changes that we could document as well. These physical changes included that their watches frequently would break or not work, they demagnetized their credit cards, their immune systems would function better, and they often had heightened intelligence as a result of the experience. Could it be that all of these near-death experiences are actually describing heaven? And if they are, does proof of the existence of heaven also prove the existence of its dark alternative, a place called hell? Perhaps there's something to be gained from an examination of the life of the person caught up in this experience. What kind of lasting and significant changes take place in a person's life after such a traumatic event? Or does it just disappear into the forgotten shadows of memory? It's not something most people like to think about, much less talk about. But the existence of heaven, based on the readings of almost any Judeo-Christian writing, virtually guarantees the existence of its opposite domain, the fearful underworld, Hades, the kingdom of the devil, commonly known as hell. Biblically, there's going to be the physical resurrection of all people, some to eternal life, and some to eternal separation from God, His goodness, and His glory. And it is because that is what they choose. Uh, in the Christian belief, we believe in heaven and hell, because without a hell, there would be no choice. God is neither a cosmic rapist who forces His love on people, nor a cosmic puppeteer who forces people to love Him. Rather, God, the very personification of love, grants us choice. So people who have lived a whole lifetime voluntarily distancing themselves from God are not in the end going to be involuntarily dragged into His presence for all eternity. If they were, heaven would not be heaven. Heaven, in fact, would be hell. The discovery of heaven, then, is certain to confirm the existence of the place Jesus describes in Luke chapter 16. Jesus tells the story of a rich man who died and is sent to hell. He looks up from hell where he is in torment and he sees Abraham far away. He begs Abraham to have pity on him because he pleads, I am in agony in this fire. We have heard of NDEs that relate to heaven, but are there those from the dark side? As a matter of fact, there are. Howard Storm had always considered himself to be a free thinker. He was also an avowed atheist. To him, belief in God was absurd. But a trip to Paris in 1985 changed all that. Oh! 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 Honey! Howard! Storm was diagnosed with a perforation in his small intestines. In a Paris hospital, Howard's condition weakened until believing he was near death, he said goodbye to his wife and shortly after slipped into unconsciousness. When I opened my eyes, I found myself standing next to the bed and I thought, this is impossible because just moments before I'd been dying. Then I saw Beverly, my wife, sitting in the chair opposite Beverly, me on the other side of the bed and I tried to talk to her, but she acted like she couldn't see me or hear me. Beverly. No one could see right. me or hear me. And then I heard voices calling me from outside the room. These people outside the room were saying, hurry up, come with us. We've been waiting for you a long time. You've got to go now. And I thought they'd come to help me. I kept asking them who they were, but they just insisted that they had come for me, they had been waiting for me, and it was time to go with them. So I thought they were to take me to my operation, and I went with them. They started to push and pull at me, yelling and screaming at me, and I fought back as hard as I could. There were dozens of them, maybe hundreds, thousands. There's no way to tell in that darkness 
swarming all over me. The more I fought, the more vicious they became. To my horror, I realized that they were tearing me apart, consuming me. All of them were laughing and taunting me. And the more they hurt me, the better they liked it. As I lay there on the ground in a fetal position, trying to protect myself from their kicks and their taunting, I heard a voice say, pray to God. And I thought, I don't believe in God. How can I pray? And a second time, it said, pray to God. And a third time, and it came out all mixed up with the 23rd Psalm and the Pledge of Allegiance and the Lord's Prayer, just little bits of them that I could remember. But the people around me hated any mention of God. And they were screaming at me. And in my desperation, I yelled out into the darkness, Jesus, please save me. And with that, a tiny light appeared in the darkness and became very bright. And it was the most brilliant, beautiful light that lifted me up and filled me with ecstasy. And I knew absolutely that this was the Jesus that I'd believed in as a child. He took me out of that horrible place that I now know was hell. And we began to approach heaven. With Jesus and the angels that he called over to us, we went over my life from its beginning to the end, and I was so ashamed of the things that I had done in my life. But the important thing is I knew that God loved me and Jesus and the angels loved me in spite of the things that I had done. And eventually they told me that I had to come back into this world, which was almost unbearable to me to be separated from them. But I knew that through their love for me and my love for them that I would never be separated from God or the heavenly beings or Jesus again. Incredible as his experience sounds, Howard Storm remains convinced it was real. In fact, that experience brought about a radical change in Howard's life and transformed him from an unbelieving atheist to a committed believer. He credits that single event for causing a complete turnaround in his life. I think the most important thing about near-death experiences is the way people's lives are changed. It has been studied by scientists that people who've had near-death experiences lose their fear of death. But more importantly, people who have had near-death experiences know that there is a governing love that rules the universe and they want to be a part of it. And their lives are changed for the better to be a part of that love. Based on Storm's experience, heaven's counterpart, hell, is equally real. But what of those whose experience is not as chilling as Howard Storm's? It's understandable that such a dramatic encounter with hell might change a person's life, but what happens to those who experience something entirely different? And one of the more famous near-death experiences, Danny and Brinkley, also endured a life-altering encounter. Danny tells of his experience in complete detail in his book, Saved by the Light. But the basic facts are these. Danny was talking to a friend on the phone in the bedroom of his home in Aiken, South Carolina. Uh, look, I gotta go. No, I, I just don't like thunderstorms. Danny had never been comfortable during thunderstorms, and he was anxious to get off the phone and get away from anything electric. Suddenly, there was an explosion in his ear. Danny was jerked out of his shoes and hurled back into the bed. His body shattered almost beyond recognition. Danny remembers leaving his body and watching as his wife, Sandy, tried to keep him alive with CPR. Once he dropped back into his tortured body, but not for long. Soon he was out again watching the medical technicians desperately trying to save his life. As the ambulance began to pull away, Danny saw a number of amazing things. But let's have Danny describe the experience in his own words. There was a sound of chimes as the tunnel spiraled toward me and then around me. Then all of a sudden there was no Sandy crying. There were no paramedics working on me. There was no ambulance radio chatter. There was just me and the tunnel. I looked ahead into the darkness. There was a light up there. I began to move toward it quickly as possible. 
I was moving without legs at a high rate of speed. Ahead, the light became brighter and brighter until it overtook the darkness and it left me standing in a paradise of brilliant light. It was the brightest light I'd ever seen, but it was soothing to my eyes. I looked to my right and could see a silver form appearing like a silhouette through a mist. As it approached, I began to feel a deep sense of love that encompassed all the meanings of that word. It was as though I was seeing a lover, a mother, a best friend, and multiples a thousandfold. This being engulfed me, and as it did, I began to experience my whole life, feeling and seeing everything that had ever happened to me. Suddenly, Danny was back at the hospital, down at the frantic scene in the emergency room. The ambulance attendants had done their best to try and revive him, but they had given up. And now as he watched, the doctors finally gave up and pulled the sheet over his head, pronounced him dead, and pushed the gurney out into the hallway. The next stop for Danyon was the morgue. Then, perhaps the most frightening part of the whole experience, Suddenly, he was back in his body, under the sheet, looking up at it with tortured eyes. Danny couldn't move or even make a noise, and the orderlies were coming to take him to the morgue. What's more, now that he was back in his body, it seemed like even his thoughts caused him pain. He saw shadows through the sheet and hoped they would notice because he did the only thing he could do. He blew on the sheet from underneath. Hey, hey, come here, he's alive. Look, hey! The body Danny came back to was horribly damaged. It would be months before he could move his arms or stand, let alone walk. But the experience would bring about a profound change in his life. One of the most provocative points about the near-death experience is it begins to open up an understanding that there is a life after death. Not only is there a life after death, there is a system by which we leave this world to enter that one. And the more we study that, the greater the opportunity to lift the veil so that we know that there is not only this life, but a life after this one. From my personal experience, I know there's a life after death. Why? I've had three of these experiences one death experience and two near-death experiences. Struck by lightning in 1975, declared clinically dead for 28 minutes. Collapsing of heart failure and having emergency open heart surgery in 1989. And then having to have emergency brain surgery in 1997. All complications from being struck by lightning. There is a life after death, a wondrous, glorious place that awaits us. The near-death experience begins to truly open the door where science and medicine can begin to look at life after death and if there is a heaven. But personally, after going through three of these experiences, I'd like to say this. If you don't believe there's a life after death, you're missing the greatest part of your own life. From that day to this, Daniel Brinkley has devoted his life to helping others. His Compassion and Action organization gives hope and understanding to hundreds each year. For both Howard Storm and Daniel Brinkley, a profound experience with both heaven and hell brought about life-altering changes that brought them close to God and motivated them to share God's love and compassion with others. There are other NDEs that leave the person in a profound state of euphoria, even in the face of tragedy. I've had a very personal experience. In the accident in 1975, an automobile accident, when my spirit left my body in the emergency room, it was a very real thing. I saw the doctors, I saw my body, and I, yet I was enjoying a tremendous peace while I watched my body there in pain. And it was just a glorious experience. It was just as real as, as physical life, but there was a spiritual uh, atmosphere to the whole thing. So I do believe in life after death. I know it exists. I have experienced it. All of these people appear to have discovered something beyond the experience of the rest of us. But will the rest of us have to die to find out? 
Or perhaps is there something to be gained about heaven from their depth of knowledge? Someone once said, the wise learn from experience. The wisest learn from the experience of others. When my spirit left my body, uh, during the time that I was experiencing this wonderful peace, I became concerned about my friends being worried. And when I thought about them at church, it was like my spirit was transported there. I saw my friend who was the guest speaker that morning, saw him go to the piano, saw him read his scripture text, even saw the Bible. And then uh, later that evening, uh, my sister was in the room with me after I was in a private room. And she was telling me about what comfort they had at the service at the church that morning. And it was annoying me because I wasn't feeling well and I wanted her to quit talking. So I told her, I said, yes, I know all about it. And I finished her sentences and told her what had happened at church. And she knew that my body was in an emergency room at the time this was taking place. But my spirit was in church. A few days later, my friend who had been the guest minister that morning had heard about the experience and he came to see me because he had heard that I had seen him in the pulpit. And I told him, I said, Cleveland, I saw the page from which you read and I described it, that his text was, uh, had been marked with red markers. And so he brought his Bible over and opened it up and it was exactly as I had described it as though I had been looking over his shoulder when he read the text to the congregation that morning. Can the mystery of heaven and the life hereafter only be found then through faith in God? Without Jesus Christ, Son of God and Savior, there is no heaven for anyone. He is the way, the truth, and the life. In my experience, and I think in your experience too, there's a longing for heaven deep in our heart. No one longs for extinction. Everybody longs for fulfillment and happiness. I believe that that longing for fulfillment and happiness beyond this world is itself a pointer to heaven, and everybody has it in, deep inside them. The religious beliefs of people do influence, most definitely, both their belief about heaven and the reality of heaven for them. For the believer, the acceptance of heaven is a matter of faith. Scientific proof then, while gratifying, is not necessary to sustain that faith. But as the evidence for heaven gains scientific momentum, it is certain to find its way into a larger arena of public discourse. The medical community is beginning to build a scientific case with these remarkable case studies, but what other promising scientific research is going on? In science's search for heaven, there's the possibility of an answer to the whole question of creation, not just the end of life, but the beginning as well. Is it possible to determine the validity of the anecdotal evidence? What does the world of physics, mathematics, and astronomy have to say about the possibility of life after death? The evidence uncovered so far suggests not only an increasing level of awareness of the spiritual being in all of us, but a growing sense of the importance of that part of us. Due largely to the ability of modern medicine to rescue people from death, an increasing number of people are bearing witness of life beyond the grave. As our search continues, a number of highly qualified researchers are trying to discover ways to demonstrate that these experiences are fact, not fantasy. Some areas of psychological study, for example, still suggest it is our cultural conditioning that actually determines what we think about death and heaven. According to this line of reasoning, we interpret our experiences based on what we have been taught or our worldview. Could it be as simple as that? Dr. Kenneth Ring, the author of Lessons from the Light and Heading Toward Omega, decided to tackle that notion head on on the assumption that if cultural conditioning actually sets the stage, so to speak, for the clear and vivid images of a near-death experience, a blind person, particularly someone who has been blind from birth, would have a very different experience. 
I recently did a study in which I interviewed 31 persons who were blind about their near-death experiences, including a number who were blind from birth. 80% of these blind persons report being able to see, to see things of this world during their near-death encounters. When people talk about near-death experiences and describe them in heavenly terms, they often talk about a realm of tremendous dazzling light, of supernal beauty, and a feeling of total unconditional acceptance and, and love. I think one effect of having interviewed so many people about their near-death experiences on me personally is that it's made me feel a lot more comfortable about death. I think death is I wouldn't say it's something to look forward to, but I don't think we have to have anything to fear in the moment of death itself, however painful the process of dying may be. Again, I think the near-death experience is a dying experience. It's not an after-death experience. These people are not going to heaven and hell and coming back and telling us what it's like. I do think that it's a powerful spiritual experience during the dying process. It's on the road, but it's not actually there. So it suggests that there is a spiritual realm that's leading somewhere, but exactly where is not what the near-death experience is going to tell us. The Apostle Paul tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What's going to tell us where we're going, where heaven actually is, and how we go about getting there? Are near-death and out-of-body experiences the only tangible evidence of the road to heaven? Besides near-death experiences, there are two pieces of evidence that indicate the reality of heaven. First, there is considerable evidence that God exists. And if God exists, it's quite likely that there is an afterlife, because He would not create people and then snuff them out of existence. Secondly, there is solid historical evidence that Jesus of Nazareth actually rose bodily from the dead. If that is a historical fact, as I believe the evidence indicates, then he has been to the afterlife and come back and told us what it's like. He can speak with authority, therefore, because he has actually seen it since he rose from the dead himself. The most provocative evidence that we have that there is a heaven is what God's Word says about it. Heaven cannot be proved scientifically, so we have to have faith in what God said in His Word. From the Christian point of view, of course, faith is the most important factor. But accepting that, what about scientific progress? What kind of interest is there in the scientific community? It may come as a surprise to many that from the late 17th century until today, there have been many highly respected scientists who have been working to prove that immortality is a natural physical phenomenon and its study is in fact a branch of physics. J.J. Thompson, who discovered the electron, is among that group, as is Thomas Alva Edison. And one of the world's lesser known but most prolific scientists and inventors, a man by the name of George Meek, gave up a highly profitable career and sold most of his businesses in order to pursue his quest for the possibility of a life hereafter. Long recognized as a brilliant American scientist and inventor with scores of industrial patents, George Meek, at age 60, retired and began 25 years of intensive research into life after death. He traveled the world to locate and to establish research projects with top medical doctors, psychiatrists, physicists, biochemists, ministers, priests, and rabbis. In 1987, he published the conclusions of his quarter of a century of research. For the first time in 8,000 years of recorded history, we can say with certainty that our mind, memory, personality, and soul will survive physical death. But if our soul survives, is there any research to tell us where it will be? Dr. R.C. Sproul thinks he may have an answer. When we talk about the awareness of heaven, I believe that it is a place, but it's a different kind of place. It's, it's a place that's, uh, uh, that crosses a dimension, a dimensional barrier, which in terms of our concept of dimensional space, it could be right here, it could be right next door, but into another realm, beyond, transcendentally beyond the uh, three-dimensional type of reality that we experience normally. The Bible teaches that heaven is in the northernmost part of the universe. Isaiah talks about Lucifer leading a rebellion against God in the sides of the north. Job 26 talks about heaven 
God making heaven and stretched it over an empty place. Scientists know there is a hole in the northernmost part of the universe. Perhaps heaven is just beyond that, about 21 billion light years away. But whether heaven is right next door or beyond our gaze someplace out there in the sky, we can be sure it's there. If, for example, it's been proven, as George Meek suggests, that we live on after physical death, the clear implication is that there must be a place, a geography for heaven. Could it be that we must become as a little child to find it? Dr. Melvin Morse, a leading world authority on dying children, described himself as an arrogant critical care physician with an emotional bias against anything spiritual. But that was before he began a series of scientifically based studies of dying children. He found that many others had already arrived at the conclusions he would soon come to. All right, good. Well, then that's what we'll do. Okay. All right, thanks. You bet. When I review the medical literature, I think it points clearly to scientific evidence that something survives human death. This evidence includes case reports, reviews of the existing scientific literature, as well as direct experimental evidence, all causing a growing body of evidence in the scientific community, making it respectable to speculate that something survives human death. I think the message of the near-death experience is that there is something there other than our physical reality. There is a spiritual realm. I also think that there's the message of God. There is a God there. It's similar to the general revelation that we see in the first chapter of Romans uh, that Paul wrote in the New Testament, that the law of God is written on the hearts of all men. And I think that the near-death experience is bringing that to the person's awareness at the time they're in the process of dying. Some people have come to me with a question, isn't there some middle ground between skeptics and believers in certain religions about this issue of heaven, or hell for that matter? My point of view is there is absolutely no middle ground. Either heaven exists or it doesn't exist. The important thing is to find out if it does exist, what is necessary, what's involved, and what authority do you use to know that it exists. When you go to the Bible and you look at the 668 historical prophecies all shown to be true, that gives you some confidence that any future activities such as life after death and heaven would also be true. Among a growing group of scientists who seem to be accepting of the notion of an eternal spirit is Dr. Stephen Hawking, widely regarded as the most brilliant scientific mind of this or perhaps any age. In what many regard as a complete turnabout, Dr. Hawking, in his book, The Theory of Everything, The Origin and the Fate of the Universe, writes, It would be very difficult to explain why the universe should have begun in just this way except as the act of a god who intended to create beings like us. The whole history of the universe can be said to be the work of God. However, if we do discover a complete theory it should, in time, be understandable by everyone not just a few scientists. If we find the answer to that, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reason, for then we would know the mind of God. At long last, the discussion is out on the scientific table. And Hawking is not the only scientist who has opened his mind to the intriguing possibilities of a world that was created especially for a mortal life. Nobel Prize winning biochemist Francis Creek states, the origin of life appears to be almost a miracle. So many are the conditions that would have to be satisfied to get it going. The internationally renowned physicist Paul Davies concedes that it is in the fundamental constants of nature that we find the most surprising evidence for a grand design. Another Nobel Prize winner in the field of physiology and medicine, John C. Eccles, asserts that in some mysterious way, God is the creator of all living forms, and particularly in human persons, each with conscious selfhood of an immortal soul. And astronomer Owen Gingrich states flatly that just as I believe the book of scripture illuminates the path of God, 
So I believe the book of nature, with its astonishing details, a blade of grass, or the resonant levels of the carbon atom, also suggest a God of purpose, a God of design. With God now in the picture as the author of that grand design, the discussion suddenly branches out into other scientific areas. For example, that branch of physics that holds to the theory of the Big Bang. Can the idea of some unknown cosmic accident billions of years ago be reconciled with the notion of a universe that is the product of an elegant design? Not according to Oxford mathematician Roger Penrose, who actually calculated the odds against the possible generation of life dating back to the inception of the so-called Big Bang. His arithmetic reveals the staggering odds of one out of a billion, billion, billion repeated more than a billion, billion times. In other words, a mathematical and statistical impossibility. So, given that reality, is there anything that can bring the assurance of religion and the pragmatism of science together? Well, perhaps there is. In his new book, Dr. T. Lee Bauman suggests the unifying concept may be light. In my research, I have tried to look closely at the latest information on near-death experiences, at the latest thinking in quantum physics, at new interpretations of information from the Bible, as well as the mysterious, fascinating nature of light. Other researchers, notably Drs. Moody and Morse, have found light to be the keynote event, the element that always leads to a transformation in their lives. But the question is, why light? Why not darkness? Physiologically, isn't death a descent into darkness? Yet Danian Brinkley and almost all others who have experienced near death see light. Why? The fact is, there is no rational medical explanation for this occurrence. Einstein, however, showed us in the flow of light the corollary of the eternal now. Today, more scientists are recognizing the significance of the electromagnetic radiation that pervades our daily lives, including light. Incredibly, physicists have performed experiments that even suggest light is conscious. That is to say, in these experiments, light appears to be capable of making decisions. If a relationship possibly exists between light and a supreme being, Perhaps it manifests in ways that have already been revealed to those who over the centuries have been believers in God. Scripture abounds with references that are especially meaningful in this new context. In Psalms 104 we read, O Lord my God, thou art very great, thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment. John chapter 8 verse 12 says, Again Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, a clear testimony is given. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. This barely scratches the surface of both the Old and New Testament references concerning God manifesting himself as light. The Bible is replete with references to light, its power and function. The mystical Jewish text known as the Kabbalah tells us that the light created by God in the act of creation was flared from one end of the universe to the other and was hidden away. Could it be that science, after all these years, is about to write a preamble to the book of Genesis? My research would indicate that the common element for near death, for scientific research on light, for uh, quantum physics in general, is that light is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and has a consciousness. 
with those facts which again have been scientifically proven it appears conclusive to me that light and God are intimately associated. The scripture is full of Bible references concerning God and light. And of course, heaven uh, is filled with the light of God. When someone dies, it's not unusual for them experiencing some kind of light, whether it is God appearing to them in some kind of light form, or whether they're seeing heaven itself in some kind of light form. The scripture says in Revelation that the New Jerusalem doesn't need a sun or a moon because the Lamb of God or Jesus is the light thereof. Jesus has been glorified by Father God and the light or glory of Jesus is very brilliant. Often when people die and see Jesus, they will describe him as being a being of great light. When we go to heaven, all three parts of our makeup is what ascends to the presence of God. The physical, the body, the mind, and the spirit. Of course, the physical part is changed. The Bible says we will be changed to be like Jesus. And so the physical part is changed from the composition of flesh and bone and blood to flesh, bone, and light. But even if, as George Meek insists, we can now say with certainty that there is a life beyond this one. Where does that take us in our search? If science is at last willing to help light the way, can we find additional evidence for a place called heaven? Could it be that we're closer to our lost loved ones than we realize? Has scientific evidence already been uncovered that points toward the other world? In a universe teeming with all kinds of interstellar activity, it seems odd that critics and skeptics still maintain that there is nothing out there except empty space. But then critics and skeptics have been known to be wrong. Sir William Priest, chief engineer of Britain's post office, is remembered primarily for stating that Edison's electric lamp was a completely idiotic idea. And he wasn't alone. Several professors, including Henry Morton, who just as Edison was about to demonstrate the electric light globe, stated, on behalf of science, Edison's experiments are a fraud on the public. The Scientific American, the New York Times, the New York Herald and academics from the U.S. Army all heaped derision on the Wright brothers, claiming it was scientifically impossible for machines to fly. Prior to Christopher Columbus, the experts believed the world was flat. And even in a more sophisticated world, many skeptics still didn't get it. Too many of them, even to count, stated that it was ridiculous to suggest that television waves could produce a picture. Historically, someone inevitably comes along to puncture the balloon of scholarly consensus. Given that reality, could it be that we've been looking for heaven in the wrong place? Is it possible that answers about heaven can be found in a physics class? Which brings us to a point in our investigation few people ever get to, simply because the language of physics is often difficult to understand. But according to Dr. Morris, there are physicists who are attempting to bring the discussion down to a more understandable level. In England today, a group of scientists, mathematicians, and university professors are working with subatomic particles and mathematical calculations, which they believe could confirm that so-called deceased entities, although composed of different atomic components, exist in and share the same space with this material world. Perhaps the most important question is can these scientists through physics confirm the existence of the individual soul? I believe there is proof that the soul exists. I think quantum physics itself indicates the existence of another realm, uh, a realm that we might say is the realm of the soul. And it indicates that consciousness itself is something outside of just the mere body. Well, that certainly is an interesting concept, and it may challenge some of our traditional thinking. But the important question is, does it square with biblical truth? How does the Bible correlate with the new physics? Can it be reconciled with a scientific view? Interestingly, Dr. Sheets thinks it can. 
Particle physics tells us that there are possibly 11 different dimensions. When Jesus appeared to his disciples in Luke chapter 24, he appeared to them in a closed up room. And yet he had flesh and he had bone, he could eat and drink. How did he do that? Well, we are told that that would occur in the sixth dimension. So evidently, in a glorified body, dimensions are increased. There's a release from our dimensions now of length, breadth, and height, and dimensions are multiplied. And we are told that Jesus appearing to his disciples in a closed up room would happen in the sixth dimension. From the sixth dimension, you could eat an orange from the inside out. It seems that the Bible and science, much to the consternation of some skeptics, do confirm each other. Heaven could be just a step across the threshold into a whole new realm. Heaven is a place where relationships are restored. Relationship with God and relationship with friends or family that have already gone on. Heaven is also a place where destiny is fulfilled. Our time on earth is short, but our time in heaven is forever. So destiny is started here. Destiny is fulfilled when we get to heaven. Could it be that God provides these scientific insights and near-death experiences to demonstrate that he's real, that heaven is real, and that through knowledge and experience, our faith can be strengthened? Many people with near-death experiences do tell us that they feel that God gave them this experience for a specific purpose, usually something that was going on in their lives. And some have also expressed the opinion that perhaps these things are divulged to human beings because God wants to certify for us or affirm that there is a life after death. 